Hello. Good evening, everybody. If I could get your attention up here. Good evening. Hello, every. Don't make me get loud. Y'all know I can. Hello, leaders. Yes. Hi, everybody. I know you guys. You guys are excited. You got food. You got something to drink. It gets you all riled up. I know. But we are here to keep the program going. Let me get a two-step if you can hear me. Ah. I don't think they can't hear me in the back. The, the, the alcohol is flowing back there. Uh-uh. OK. We're going we gonna to keep it rocking, though. I'm so glad that you guys found your way up here. It was a little bit of a maze, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But now that you got something to drink, I want to introduce a representative from tonight's sponsor, Google. Google is giving away $2 billion tonight. I thought, I, thought, I thought that would get your attention. They're not. They're not. They're not. I just wanted to see who was listening, you know. Two billion dollars, got a whole group of people like, whoa, hey. <laughs> All right. I want to introduce a representative from the evening sponsor, Google. Google last year announced a $1 billion investment in Africa over five years to cover a range of initiatives from improved connectivity to investments in startups. The folks who are talking, they're going to miss all their blessing. It's OK. God told me to tell you you're not going to make it. Here today to tell us why and how Google is investing in Africa is James Maika, Senior Vice President for Technology and Society, Google Alphabet. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Yvonne, for the uh, kind introduction. Secretary Blinken, Mayor Adams, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, good evening. Uh, or I should say, Maneru, as we say in Zimbabwe, where I was born. I'd like to thank uh, our esteemed colleagues at the Tony Alumni Foundation and the State Department for putting together this very important event. Google is proud to support this gathering and what it represents. And we're looking forward to this week's summit and the opportunity to learn more from each other about how to expand innovation, entrepreneurship, and advance Africa's digital transformation. Sundar Pichai, our CEO, recently said something that I believe in, and I think many of you would agree with this, which is that, quote, increasingly Africa is a place where innovation begins and spreads to the rest of the world, end of quote. At Google, we believe that African-led innovation is important to addressing many of the opportunities and the enduring challenges that the world faces. And Google's very proud to be a partner in Africa's economic growth and digital transformation. And this goes all the way back to Google's very early days. Some of you may not know that Google actually bet on Africa in 2005 when it was still a very young company with the investment in a major submarine telecommunications cable, the Seacom cable, and it's an investment that we've actually doubled down on ever since. We took our biggest step last year, as Yvonne mentioned, uh, when we actually announced our plan and commitment to invest $1 billion in Africa over the next five years. And our priorities in that investment include a few things. They focus on ensuring affordable internet access, on investing in people and in startups, and also using innovation to advance societal goals and challenges that plague the continent. As part of this investment, I should mention a few things that we're already doing and have begun to do. First is we've actually developed the, and deployed a state-of-the-art Equiano Sea cable that runs all the way from Portugal and al along the entire western seaboard of the African uh, continent, all the way touching multiple countries, all the way down to South Africa. And this is going to help provide faster and cheaper connectivity across the continent, driving more than $17 billion in economic growth and also creating jobs in the countries that it touches. 
We've also accelerated our commitment to empower 10 million learners in Africa with digital skills. In fact, we're already ahead of schedule. We've already hit 6 million uh, people who've actually trained with digital skills, and we plan to do more, and we're not done yet. We've also tried to harness artificial intelligence, and in fact, recently this year, we added 10 new African languages uh, spoken by over 165 million uh, Africans to Google Translate. We've also enabled things like enabled um, the detection of locust uh, breeding grounds, which actually are fundamental to tackling the food insecurity issues, especially in As West Africa and other parts. And we've also expanded our, in an era of climate change and climate disasters, we've actually expanded our flood forecasting alerts to 15 African countries just this year. Uh, let me say a few more things quickly about our work and partnerships with respect to advancing innovation and entrepreneurship specifically. First of all, we recently set up an AI research center in Ghana, in, 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 in Accra, and this is our first such uh, investment on the continent, and it focuses on developing African approaches to using AI technologies to tackle the issues and opportunities in Africa. Our Google X Tara team is using advanced laser technology to bring high-speed connectivity to places that have very little infrastructure. And already we're working with local partners in about six countries that are already receiving the benefits of this technology. To support entrepreneurship, we've partnered with the African Union to mobilize support for startups and SMBs across all 55 countries. And in fact, already we've invested in over 110 uh, black startups in Africa and also created a Founders Innovation Fund for African entrepreneurs, which will help expand the African ecosystem. Earlier this year, we actually were a founding partner of the UN's GABI initiative. This is the Global Africa Business Initiative, uh, which we launched at UNGA, where the theme for that, for that initiative is actually Unstoppable Africa something we're very excited about, and we're already driving conversations and to bring aboard many other partners to work with us to advance these initiatives. And we're also quite excited with the launch of the administration's new Digital Africa initiative uh, that I suspect we'll hear more about from the Secretary, and we're looking forward to working closely with the U.S. government to help enable African innovation and entrepreneurship uh, and enable it to thrive across both Africa and, quite frankly, bring it to the rest of the world. So as we look to the future, we believe it, it is, in fact, partnerships uh, that are fundamentally important and that, the, that, that enable these African-led innovations and entrepreneurs to take the opportunities that lie ahead of them. And we're very excited about the, all the African entrepreneurs we see, including the ones we've seen here today, uh, that will help advance digital innovation and transformation. So I'd like to thank all of you, and I look forward to a very productive week. Thank you very much. All right, all right. So here's what we're going to do. Because um, the noise on the other side, that's not going to fly over here, guys. We are invited guests. And one thing I know about Africans, we love respect. We love hospitality. And so we're, when we are invited guests in somebody's house, what do we do? We're going to take it back. Black church style. Turn to your neighbor. <laughs> Say, neighbor, neighbor, you're talking right now. <laughs> and I would like to hear what's happening on stage. So, neighbor, neighbor. can you please be quiet? Neighbor, neighbor. for the entirety of the speeches. <laughs> God bless y'all. Okay. Ha ha. Hallelujah. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Thank you. All right. Please allow me to bring up on stage next. I got me, got my, me sweating out my curls now. Um, <laughs> where do I go next? All right. Thank you. Um, it is really, truly an honor to hear how American and African innovation are converging and all the work that Google is doing to out y'all. I'll take my heels off. Don't play with me. And now for the moment we have truly been waiting for, let us please welcome to the stage Myron Br Brilliant, and he is, we talked, and he's very brilliant, Executive Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce 
and Travis Atkins, President and CEO yeah, of the U.S. African Development Bank, to share with us the story and the results of the 2002 Africa Digital Innovation Competition pitch. Are you all ready to hear who won? Are you going to stay quiet to hear who won, though? Okay. God bless everybody. Come on. Come on. Travis. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief because I don't want to get in front of the diaspora and our youth entrepreneurial winners. I uh, just want to take a moment to say uh, that to see you all from this vantage point is to remember why I fell madly in love with the people of Africa uh, and their wonderful diaspora, which I uh, and my mothers and fathers are so happy uh, to be a part of. Uh, good evening to all of you. It's my great honor to represent the U.S. African Development Foundation here uh, this evening uh, among tremendous gathering of, as such as this of innovators, change makers, investors from Africa and the African diaspora. Uh, first, I wanted to just take a moment to follow up on what James was talking about in terms of the notion uh, of partnership. None of us can do it alone. And so in the spirit of that, I wanted to thank my dear brother Tony Alimalu and the Tony Alimalu Foundation, uh, whom the U.S. African Development uh, Foundation has just signed a five-year, $20 million partnership uh, to invest in women and youth entrepreneurs in about 16 countries yeah. across our beloved continent. Uh, continuing on that theme, we are super excited to be a partner of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce this evening uh, for their annual Digital Innovators uh, competition. Uh, we're so excited uh, because we believe at the U.S. African Development Foundation uh, that Africa is the continent not only of now, uh, but also of the future. And so in that spirit, let's get to find out who the winners are, where these votes came down, and who we will celebrate. You want to come on up? Mike? I will. Thank you. So I hold the results here, and if you want to hear them, you've got to quiet down. Let me begin by just saying, Evan, you've got a lot on your plate, but it, we're going to hire you at some point to do an event with us as well at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Let me thank uh, Secretary Blinken and the State Department, Dorothy McAuliffe and Jose Fernandez and all the people at State that are making not only tonight available to all of us, but the next couple of days. Please give Secretary Blinken and the State Department a round of applause. Is that all you can do? Let's raise it up. Now, let me also say there is so much excitement in this room. There is so much energy, and it's because so much is going on in Africa. And we've been talking about the entrepreneurial spirit, the innovation that is relevant in this room, but there's a lot of work still to be done. And so for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the largest business organization in this country, the work does not stop when the summit ends. The work continues. And for the entrepreneurs in this room, what we want is the partnership with our government and the governments represented here during this summit to continue to drive innovation in partnership with the private sector. Please, please endorse that and support that. I also want to recognize there's so many companies here, Google, James, what a great job in talking about connectivity, and that's what this is about. So let me just say, without further ado, how proud I am of the U.S. Chamber's team, Dr. Yao, for your introduction of these incredible entrepreneurs, and thank Scott Eisner, the head of the Africa program, and the others have been driving the business summit with the Corporate Council of Africa. You'll see more of that over the next days. But Travis, my man, the U.S. African Development Foundation is the reason these companies are being recognized and more importantly, being supported. So please give Travis a big round of applause. I think if you know anything about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, you know that we want to support innovation, we want to support startups, we want to support small businesses, because every small business has an opportunity to become a bigger business. And so this is the second year that the U.S. Chamber has sponsored this competition. But I can assure you, it won't be our last year. We want to get bigger and better. 
And Evan, I'm going to steal a line from what you said downstairs. I like the idea of an African shark tank theme. Let's keep building on it. Let's bring the entrepreneurs in together. So what started last year in Nigeria is now a content-wide competition. We had 2,000 applicants. How many are in this room who are in applicants for today's prize? Come on, raise your hand if you were an applicant. Well, that tells me that we had 2,000. We need to have everyone in this room be an applicant if you're a startup, spanning 50 countries. And we took 2,000 applicants and got down to three finalists that you heard about today. So we're finally excited to announce the winners of our digital innovation competition. So without further ado, let me just say what they're going to win. They're going to win a cash prize. That's not so bad, right? They're going to win mentorship from three of the greatest companies in the United States and around the world, Microsoft, AWS, and Standard Bank. So thank all those companies for that. And that mentorship was discussed about earlier. And third, they're going to get a plaque from Travis and me. Now, something about that plaque. There are no words on that plaque because we didn't know who was going to win. That's what democracy is about. That's what good government is about. So we have no thing on the plaque, but I want to assure the winners we will put your name and your company on the plaque. So in third prize, third, third prize, but everyone who competed was a winner. And the three winners tonight are winners, but everyone was a winner for this competition. Third prize from Ghana, a startup that has digitally integrated more than 3,000 informal shops into retail networks with suppliers. Frank was on a plane. I don't know if he ever made it here. But Frank, thank you. And most importantly, Shapa, thank you. And coming up to is Dr. Yao. Travis, you do the honors of announcing. Travis, you've got to announce the second prize. Fantastic. Our second prize winner, who dazzled us tonight with her rhetoric, with her story, with her voice, Ore from Grow at Greek, Kenya. Okay, there isn't much surprise on who won it now, since we only had three contestants and we voted on three contestants, I think we know who won first prize. From Nigeria, a business that went from having its co-founders, both former doctors, deliver blood to hospitals via motorcycles to deploying AI chatbot to assure hospitals got the life-saving blood they needed during the COVID pandemic. Health Robotics Limited is the winner, Mr. Tanjane. I just wanted to make clear something that Myron was sharing with us a, a few moments ago. Uh, when he said that everyone was a winner, uh, he wasn't just saying that in the sense of moral victory. Uh, what we decided to do at USADF uh, is to give grants from our agency to all 10 uh, finalists of the, uh, of the program. 
Uh, and so everyone who made it into the top 10 will be new grantees of our agency. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me. How many of y'all want to enter next year? We got any entrepreneurs? All right. Maybe y'all don't like, you know, fellowships with the government or help with your, uh, but I'm, I'm applying. Can I, can I apply? Okay. Y'all gonna see me back here next year. Okay. How we doing? Turn to your neighbor. Neighbor? neighbor. How we doing? Okay, that's better. Thank you so much. All right. Coming to the stage next, it brings me great honor. Now y'all know this man, this man is from the Tri-State. This man is from, from New York. He not gonna handle y'all talking. Y'all can play me if you want, but I, he been through some things. I, just, I feel like he's not going to, this not going to go well. I, I've been to Brooklyn. I've been to Harlem. I've been to Upper Manhattan, or what they calling it now? Is that what, okay. It's not going to go well for y'all if you don't listen to this man. So coming to the stage now, I am honored to welcome New York City Mayor Eric Adams. The, I just believe that as we celebrate uh, the diaspora, I'm going to say to my African brothers and sisters, we have to be present in the moment. Have to be present in the moment. Prior to becoming the mayor of the city of New York, I was the county executive for the borough of Brooklyn. Yeah. And my mother in her third grade education, was intimidated by that building. It was a room and building that was extremely impressive. But then when her son became the county executive, she would walk in the building with a different level of energy. She would walk in the building with this sense of pride and purpose. And then my aunties and my cousins and my nephew, they would come and when they entered the building, they entered with this sense of sureness that their bloodline was in charge of this county, the largest county in the city of New York. And so I need for my brothers and sisters from the diaspora to understand the moment that you're in right now. You are in a moment right now when the first time in history, you are seeing power that is not American power, but it's African power. But if you don't connect the dots, you are not going to understand the full purpose of this moment. The mayor of the most important city in the most important country is an African. It's an African. The head of the minority leadership in Congress, Hakeem Jeffries, is an African. Four of the most important cities in, Americans, in America are headed by Africans. In New York City, the top law enforcement executive, Letitia James, is an African. The head of the assembly is an African. The head of the Senate is an African. The head of the city council is an African. The public advocate is an African. The district attorney in the Bronx is an African. The district attorney in Manhattan is an African. All of this chocolate, what are we gonna do with it? So if you come to Washington, if you come to Washington, and you use this moment to be in a corner somewhere drinking wine and eating off of plates, then you don't understand the significance of this moment. Africans are running this country. You need to walk differently. You need to speak differently. You need to act differently. You need to feel the power of Africa. It's the moment we're in right now. My seven trips to Africa, watching the different energy and spirit of Africa 
We have to connect the dots. You can't walk in this country anymore feeling like a stranger when an African is running the country. You have to think differently of what we must do. You have been denied, ignored, and exploited on the continent of Africa for too long. All of your natural resources have been taken. You're the largest producer of cocoa, and others have made the chocolate out of it. Now you make the chocolate out of your cocoa coming from your country. Use your natural resources in a manner they're supposed to be used, and bridge the gap with your cousins, your uncles, your aunties that are here in America. When I went to Ghana last year, in Gorey Island two years ago, we left the continent in slavery. I returned with the majority. That is how we have to start thinking as Africans. So this conference is significant. Share ideas, cross-pollinate energy, come up with real gains. Let's focus on what is needed on the continent. And let's utilize the power we have here and make it exciting and encouraging. Let's duplicate what Ghana is doing, giving citizenships to those who are here in America so they can be citizens of the continent. Let's allow that due partnership of our aunties, our uncles, and our friends coming home. My mother transitioned last year from the physical to the spiritual. Nothing great gave me a greater honor than taking her name and placing it on the boys' wall in Ghana. We need to reawaken the spirit of our ancestors that lay on the bottom of the oceans that were ripped apart from our shores. They're watching us right now. We have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with this moment? I am ready to turn that question mark into an exclamation point of saying we will unite. And we will listen to Marcus Garvey when he stated, up you mighty people, you can be what you will. Thank you. I told you he wasn't playing around. I'm going to call him Bishop Mayor Eric. Can I call him? We're going to pass the collection plates that way. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Eric. Wow, that was empowering. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce to you a man who many of you in this room already know, Mr. Tony Elumalu, <laughs> chairman of the United Bank of Africa and founders of Ears Holding. Through the Tony Elumelu uh, Foundation, Tony has con committed to improving lives and transforming Africa and has twice been made the prestigious Time 100's Honors List for his support of African entrepreneurs, which brings him here today. Oh, wow, to so speak after you. <laughs> Such a great man. Anyway, good evening all. And um, it's great to be in Washington. It's great to be in America, and it's great for Africa to be in Washington. We are looking forward to a truly transformative uh, week. I want to say a big thank you to President Biden and the administration, and to the Secretary of State. Well done, thank you. Earlier this year, in April, during a visit to the US, I had conversations here in DC with policymakers, and my message to US was to reimagine your relationship with Africa away from aid and to focus on empowerment of youth and support for sustainable private sector institutions. My subsequent op-ed in the Hill called for a new U.S. engagement with Africa. The fact that we are gathered here in Washington this week shows to a large extent a genuine interest to re-engage in a manner that prioritizes mutual benefit and self-reliance. We see this as a genuine and substantive desire 
to re-engage with Africa and to re-engage on a basis that benefits us all. The key words are mutual respect, mutual opportunity, and mutual objectives. We appreciate particularly the focus on the private sector. I'm a businessman, and I'm happy to say that I've done well. And I'm proud to say um, that we have done good, too. I envisioned and created a bank that is in 20 African countries, in Dubai, in Paris, and in London. We are the only African bank regulated by the OCC and operates in America. My objective was to drive savings, channel capital, fund trade, most importantly, to democratize financial services, to give everyone the ability to save, prosper, and to trade, to grow businesses, and to create value in Africa. But I'm also a philanthropist. I'm a businessman. For me, the distinction is not much. We do business to do good. And the good we do builds better, stronger, sustainable businesses. I also created a foundation, the Tony Elumelu Foundation. We support entrepreneurs, not just in 20 African countries that we do business in, but across all 54 African countries. I am an entrepreneur. I know the transformative power of entrepreneurship. I pledged in 2015 100 million US dollars on behalf of our family. We have created a unique platform that identifies, trains, and networks young entrepreneurs. Now we have started partnerships with the UNDP, the ICRC, and the EU, and most recently with USADF. Travis, thank you. To date, we have disbursed over 85 million US dollars to over 18,000 young men and women, each with a non-refundable seed capital of $5,000. And our digital platform connects millions. We have trained over 1.5 million young African men and women, business education, so that when they receive capital, they know how to apply and use capital to grow. We have delivered programs for women, for fragile states, and are now working on climate change. We are in the process soon of announcing our intervention in green energy and green economy. But we know we can do more. We know we can do much more. We are bringing together a coalition, an alliance to catalyze entrepreneurship across our continent. We want to do this because we remember the Marshall Plan, and we know that Africa needs one right now so that we can move our people out of poverty. We have a growing population that's over 1.6 billion people. And of this 1.6 billion, those under the age of 30 represent over 60% of this population. We must create jobs for them. We must give economic hope to them. We must have our women economically empowered, otherwise we'll be creating problems for mankind. So this is an auspicious time. As you said, it is a time for Africa and our youth in particular. Today, those who were in the hall listened to two of our promising 18, two out of the promising 18,000 people who have empowered in Africa. In due course, you also meet our other young men and women who exemplify success made in and on the African continent. We believe in partnership, partnerships of mutual respect. In a world blighted by false emigration, extremism, visible and tangible environmental degradation, poverty, food insecurity, we want to create a beacon of hope, a bedrock of sustainable entrepreneurs who, like me, will help to also do well and do good. 
I want to thank the President of U.S. and the Secretary of State, our friends in the administration, and the agencies, USADF, USAID, Prosper Africa, and the list goes on. We look forward to collaborating, working more together so that we can make a meaningful and sustainable and different impact on the African continent. We believe that in the 21st century, it is indeed a move away from aid and a move to self-reliance, self-independence, and sustainable progress. That, to a large extent, will help us engage our young ones and help us transform Africa. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to more. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, everything he said, I concur. It is time, and this is the room. These are the people to make the difference. And now I'd like to welcome back to the stage Ms. Dorothy McAuliffe, Special Representative for Global Partnerships here at the Department of State. Well, thank you so much. It is an exciting night. It's such an honor to be joined by so many innovators and leaders from both the United States and Africa. Welcome to the State Department. As the Special Rep for Global Partnerships, I see every day the positive effect of the public-private collaboration that we have in furthering all of our shared values, building partnerships across sectors, industries, and borders to, pro to promote economic growth, opportunity, and sustainable peace has become an essential way of how we at the State Department approach U.S. diplomacy. And it's exceptional to hear from both U.S. government and private sector leaders tonight about the impact of these partnerships on the ground across Africa and beyond. And on behalf of the State Department, I first want to thank the U.S. Africa Development Foundation, Prosper Africa, and the U.S. Chamber for organizing the pitch competition earlier this evening. And congrats. I'd also like to thank Mr. Tony Alumalu and Mrs. Um Dr. Umalu and the Tony Alumalu Foundation team for co-organizing this entire innovators gathering, as well as Google for their role in sponsoring this evening's event. And finally, but not least, thanks to our chef, Pierre Thiem. Thank you, chef. Thank you, chef, for sharing this wonderful Pan-African menu with us, and I hope everyone is enjoying. It seems like they are. Um, and now it is my high honor and very distinct privilege to introduce to you the 71st U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Since taking office, Secretary Blinken has exemplified the Biden-Harris administration's deep commitment to Africa. Secretary Blinken has traveled extensively across Africa since taking office and has encouraged robust African diplomatic engagement throughout the department since day one. Thanks to Secretary Blinken's leadership, the United States and the many African countries represented here tonight are in a prime position to attain even more joint economic and diplomatic success. I look forward to hearing from the Secretary on the importance of innovative collaboration between the U.S. and Africa and how we can work together in pursuit of our shared aspirations. So please join me in welcoming Secretary of State Antony Blinken to the stage. Good evening, everyone. So, I am here to tell you that we have another 10 speakers who will soon be coming. We are so thrilled to have you here at the State Department. Now, I have not heard or seen this room this animated in the two years that I've been here. So, there's something in the water. By the way, you are in the Ben Franklin room. You can see Ben looking down on us over there. He was America's very first diplomat. He signed our first treaty. He charted the Gulf Stream. He pioneered electricity. He gave us our ethos of self-government, and none of this did he do while sober. So please feel inspired. 
Let me, uh, let me begin by thanking our extraordinary MC for this evening, Yvonne Orji. Yvonne, thank you. <laughs> Nothing makes you more insecure than having to follow Yvonne on stage. Yvonne once wrote that Nigeria made me, America raised me. We often say that one of America's greatest strengths is our diversity. There are few greater testaments to that than the immense contributions of the African diaspora community, which is clearly out in force tonight. It is great to have you here. There are so many other folks here I'd like to thank this evening. Uh, Dorothy McAuliffe and our incredible Office of Global Partnerships, the entire Prosper Africa Initiative team, our co-sponsors. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for everything you've done. Uh, Google, James, uh, an incredible cast of uh, friends, partners. Now, I'm a native New Yorker, so my mayor is here. I don't know if Mayor Bowser is here. I don't know from, from Washington, but I've also spent a lot of time as a resident of the District of Columbia. My other great mayor, Mayor Bowser, who I think was with us tonight. And I really want to thank the judges of our pitch competition, including Idris Elba. Idris, you here? You're here somewhere. Was here. And to the remarkable competitors, know this. If you can survive a pitch competition with Stringer Bell, you can survive anything. So it is fitting that we are kicking off uh, a week focused on deepening our ties with African countries and people with this inspiring group, innovators, entrepreneurs, young people. Earlier this year in South Africa, I had an opportunity to set out our administration strategy for the region. And at its core, the strategy can be distilled in one word. You've already heard it spoken tonight, partnership. It's rooted in the recognition that the United States and African nations can't deliver on any of our fundamental needs and aspirations for our people, and we can't solve any of the really big challenges we face if we don't work together. So it's about what we can do with African nations and people, not for them. Our strategy reflects the region's diversity, its influence, and, as we can see tonight, the ingenuity of its young people. You all know this. Those youth are a growing part of the continent's population and also the world's. Today, more than 60 percent of Africa's population is under the age of 25. By 2030, two in every five people on this planet will be African. These rising generations are powering dynamic economic growth in their countries and far beyond. 2016, just a few years ago, African startups raised $350 million in investment. Last year, they raised $5 billion in investment, and that's a curve that's going to keep going up and up and up. Now, it's one thing to rattle off statistics. It's another thing to meet these changemakers, as I've had a chance to do as secretary, from Dakar to Johannesburg, from Nairobi to Kinshasa. Much like the founders who took part in tonight's pitch competition, these entrepreneurs are not just running successful businesses. They're actually solving some of our most vexing problems, like closing enduring gaps in health care, helping entrepreneurs break into the formal economy. We have a huge stake in the success of African innovators, because when they're empowered to reach their full potential, it's good for the region, it's good for the continent, it's good for the world, it's good for America. Idris said it best. Africa doesn't need aid, it needs innovation. So tonight, let me just very quickly go through three ways our administration is working to broaden and deepen those partnerships to foster African innovation. First, we're investing in the infrastructure that provides the foundation for African entrepreneurship. That means creating more pathways for the free flow of ideas, of information, of investment, which in the 21st century requires one thing, digital connectivity. Let me give you one example. Africa has around twice as many internet users as the United States, yet the continent has only a fraction of our data center space. What does that mean? Slower, less reliable connectivity. That's why our U.S. Development Finance Corporation is investing $300 million in building data centers across the continent, because we need networks that can keep up with the lightning pace of new ideas. 
Second, we're investing in rising leaders. Since President Obama created the Young African Leaders Initiative, nearly 5,800 trailblazers from every country in Sub-Saharan Africa have come to the United States for academic and leadership training, developing skills, relationships that are going to last them a lifetime to the benefit of their communities, but also ours. Many of the Mandela Washington Fellows are entrepreneurs, including alum uh, Abel Haile Georgis from Ethiopia, who's here tonight. Abel's company is building bicycles and wheelchairs from bamboo, which is stronger than steel, if you write right there, sustaining our planet, supporting local farmers and local manufacturers. That's not all. In September, the U.S. Africa Development Foundation teamed up uh, with the Tony L. Umu Foundation to create a new program to provide financing, technical assistance, and mentorship to emerging innovators in Africa. We recently launched another initiative to connect up-and-coming climate entrepreneurs with American companies. Third, we are fostering greater engagement by American companies. You're going to hear more about that throughout this week. The U.S. private sector already invests more than $4 in Africa for every dollar that our government allocates to the region in foreign assistance, and it wants to do more. That's the objective of our Office of Global Partnerships, which will take a U.S. private sector delegation to Ghana in February. It's the goal of the Prosper Africa Initiative, which is marshalling agencies from across our government to help more U.S. companies and inventors, uh, investors excuse me, do business in Africa, and to do it in a way that promotes inclusive growth, growth that's sustainable for our planet. So tonight we're joined by Prosper Africa's institutional investor delegation. It manages more than a trillion dollars in savings for American workers and retirees. The delegation recently helped a group uh, US, uh, of, of U.S. pension funds, including those of teachers from Chicago, city workers from Hartford and Philadelphia, invest more than $85 billion in an African fund that will provide financing to small businesses and entrepreneurs. One more bite-sized example. Several of the items on the menu prepared tonight by Chef Pierre were made using a grain called Fonio, grown primarily in the Sahel. It's what your mom cooked uh, for you when you were growing up. So, through a partnership with Prosper Africa, Pierre's company, Yoyole, is distributing Fono and other products made by small farmers in the region to markets here in the United States, including at the Whole Foods that's just a few blocks from where we are this evening. In a region where it's getting harder to grow crops due to a warming planet, Fonio's deep roots make it virtually drought resistant. Now, in West Africa, it's also said that Fonio never embarrasses the cook, which is good news if, like me, you are no Pierre in the kitchen. So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, thank you for helping us kick off uh, an incredible week. And more importantly, thank you for all you're doing, working with us to deepen America's partnerships with African nations, partnership that has shaped our past, is shaping our present, and will, will shape our future. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful week. Thank you all very much.